the time she turned off the ignition, it was clear that the car, her first and only car, was dead forever. And she was already late for work. As the Camry went into its final death throes, Demi, who was locking the front door on her way to work, froze mid-motion as she beheld the scene, wearing an expression of disappointment, but not surprise. Cora's feeling of horror that this was even happening quickly hopped to embarrassment before settling onto her old standby. Numbness. She got out of the car, with no choice but to leave it on the street despite it being street cleaning day, approached her mother, and asked, Can you give me a ride to work? Demi looked at her like she had just lost their house in a drunken bet. Sure. It was the last word she said to Cora for about half an hour. In short order, Cora was suffering the indignity of her mother driving her to work through the vehicular sludge of the 110. In any other circumstances, Demi would have told Cora she was shit out of luck, that she should have gotten the car fixed months ago, and that she could find her own damn way up to downtown L.A. But it had been through PMT, the temp agency Demi worked for, that Cora had her temp job. And it had been Demi who had vouched for her. And so, here they were, crawling under the 105, Demi sacrificing her own punctuality for her negligent daughters. What happened to that $200 I loaned you? Asked Demi just after they passed Rosecrans. Her anger now cooled enough that she was capable of speech. You were supposed to replace the belt and get your hair done, and you have done neither. Cora resisted the urge to pull her hair behind her ears, as though that would hide her mess of a dye job. She'd bleached it blonde several months ago before she'd dropped out of college, but about six inches of her natural wet hay hair color had grown in since. I had to use it on gas, lied Cora keeping her gaze on the passenger side mirror. And I had another credit card bill I needed to pay off. The truth was, she had used that money on a Nico Case concert, her third this year. But Demi didn't need to know that. Sure you did, said Demi. After today, you take the bus. Cora did not retort or offer excuses. She knew it was absolutely on her that she had not fixed the car. The fan belt was just the last in a long line of events that only tightened the spiral of powerlessness that was coming to define her existence. And by this point, she was getting used to it. Trying to exert some control over her life was an exercise in futility, so why bother? A good concert was the one place she could genuinely lose herself, have an out-of-body experience, and detach from the deteriorating morass that was her life. And if it meant getting bitched at by her mother and an indefinite period with no car, then oh well. That's life. That was when she noticed the black town car tailing them. It was close like it was being dragged along on a hitch. So close she could see the faces of the two men in the front seat clearly. On the driver's side was a younger-looking man of East Asian descent, seeming to curse whatever cosmic force had made him be awake this early. His passenger was a slender-faced white guy with black, wavy hair, Maybe late thirties, though it was hard to tell, as his face was obscured with a cartoonishly large pair of aviators. Jesus, said Cora. What is their problem? What? Demi looked in her rearview mirror. Oh, Christ, those assholes again. Suddenly, Cora was on alert. What, you know them? Well, I've seen them said to me. More than once on my way to work, they always tailgate. Holy shit, said Cora.